I'm Mike, um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about my art practice as a game designer using JavaScript to make games and other installation art out of Weir hardware and other electronics. Um, specifically, we're talking about this hardware, which is a Western Electric 551A PBX switchboard from 1927. Um, now, I'm sure all of you are intimately familiar with Western Electric's 551 line, but in case you've forgotten, <laughs> um, the 551A was the smallest they made. The B, the next one up, is literally three of these next to each other that two people would have used. Um, this one would have been used in a hotel or a small office. Um, this actual literal specific switchboard was used at the Mead Paper Mill in Chillicothe, Ohio, uh, where there's some stickers on it that suggest, what? Chillicothe. Chillicothe, thank you. Chillicothe, Ohio, um, where there's some stickers suggesting it was used through the 60s, so probably over 40 years, which is pretty ridiculous, um, especially considering it was likely the same literal person doing that job all 40 years. Um, you can't really see here, but we have the original name labels on there that have names like Smith and Jones in the front lobby and the beer man. Um, there's a whole fascinating history there that we're not really gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about its present instead, which is this game called Hello Operator. Um, so as a game designer, I make experiences that use non-traditional interfaces that connect people to the world around them and sort of hope to teach them things about the systems that rule our world. Um, and so this was part of my research at the MIT Media Lab, where this game, you sit down and you use it as if it was your day job, actually learning how to use this hardware to connect people who want to make phone calls to each other. Um, there's obviously a bunch of concessions that had to be made uh, to like, make it a fun game, but for the most part, the goal here was actual authenticity. Um, you can learn the game by going through the interactive tutorial it has, or you could actually read the instruction manual that came with it in the 20s, and it's close enough that that would teach you how to play the game. Um, but for the most part, it's what's known as a time management game. Maybe some of you might know the early 80s arcade game Tapper, or casual games from 10 or 20 years ago called Diner Dash, um, that are all about you are some sort of, sort of service worker uh, helping people out, and you have this sort of sequence of steps to help a single customer. Like in my case, someone's light turns on because they want to make a phone call, uh, you connect them, you pick up the phone, they tell you who they want to talk to, you connect them to that person, etc. This chain of events is very simple, but when 10 people want to make calls at once, it gets very hectic very quickly and you have to manage your time pretty well. Um, so we'll touch a bit more later on sort of why and why I think this is interesting and why I take the time to do stuff like this. Um, but for the most part, I'm gonna to touch on two different things in this talk. The first part is gonna be the actual process of working with physical hardware. Like as someone who's done some hardware but is mostly a software person, what do you do when 150 pounds of 100 year old hardware shows up on your doorstep? Um, and then after that, I'll talk a bit about software and sort of cross platform stack uh, that let me actually develop this and sort of design a design process for making these digital physical hybrid games, both with Hello Operator and some other projects I've worked on. Um, so yeah, you just bought a switchboard on eBay and had it shipped halfway across the US. What do you do now? Um, you probably want to open it up and see what's inside, uh, which was the first problem we had. Uh, so the back of the switchboard came off really easily. There was this handle. Um, but you can see that front there. There are cables, there are lights, there are some switches. Um, you also might be able to see a keyhole on the front there. The surprise was locked. <laughs> um, we talked to the guy who sold it to us. He had no idea. Uh, we brought in some people who were handy with a lockpick set because it was MIT. There were a lot of those. No one could get in. Uh, we went on eBay and bought some random other keys for switchboards that looked kind of similar. Unsurprisingly, none of them worked. Um, so I ended up, like, it pained me, but I had to cut through this cheap piece of sheet metal on the bottom. We could unscrew and remove the sheet metal. We could remove the lock. Um, and that could have been it. Like, it was a little annoying having the front flapping up and down when we tried to move it. Um, but one of my colleagues, John, did probably the coolest single part of this whole project, was he looked at this lock and said, this looks really simple, I can do something with this, and grabbed a set of calipers, did some measuring, did a little bit of 3D modeling, uh, made a couple test prints in our 3D printer downstairs, and long story short, this is the 3D printed metal key that fits our 1920s lock. Um, <laughs> and like, we still actually use this, lock, this key today when, when traveling with it. Um, but so even then, you open it up, and you see this weird mass of wires, but not wires that make sense. Um, so if we take a step back and look at that front table area of the switchboard, conceptually, there are a bunch of different columns, um, where a column has two cables, two lights, two switches. Uh, conceptually, those are linked. So if you have two cables that are plugged into two different sort of ports representing 
telephones and you flip things correctly, that means those two people are talking to each other. Um, and within that, the, there's sort of a front rear connection. So the frontmost cable in a column connects to the frontmost light, connects to the frontmost switch. Um, the, front, the switches are like, you might call them single pole double throw if you've worked with hardware switches before, but not really, um, as we'll get to in a second. Um, so conceptually, they start out neutral in the middle. You can move them away from you or towards you. If you move them away from you, they stay in place. That means you are talking to the person who it is connected to, you as the operator. Um, if you pull them towards you, they're momentary, so you let it go and it snaps back, and that means you are ringing that person, like that physical phone at the other end of that cable is ringing. Um, so if you're doing this in modern electronics, like there are a couple pins coming out of it, that's relatively straightforward. Uh, this is what it looked like. Um, there are seven pins, well, each switch has two pin blocks that turned out to be mirrored. Each of those pin blocks had seven pins coming out of them. Each of those pins had probably four or five cables coming out of them. Um, and it turns out they activated in really weird circumstances. Like this pin is only going to cause a connection to ground when you're momentarily transitioning between like the middle state and the talk state. Um, and again, if you've done anything with hardware at a hobbyist level or otherwise, this is pretty weird. Um, but it turns out, like if it's the 1920s, all of the logic you have is based on relays. Um, it probably makes sense if there's something that you know you need to happen at a specific space, why not have that logic happen at the level of metal plates touching each other rather than having to construct some giant set of relays somewhere else. And similarly, if you, are, uh, if you know that this signal is gonna be needed in a whole bunch of different places, rather than find some way to multiplex it, why not run multiple cables to it? Um, which creates this weird disconnect when trying to connect it to a modern computer um, or even trying to make sense of it. Like this was the, uh, the documentation I was able to find from service manuals in the 1920s. Even electrical engineer friends I talked to were like, I have no idea what's going on. Um, so the answer, I, I wish I had a better answer than the equivalent of like debugging via print statement. Um, so for these seven pins, we grabbed some alligator clips and wired them up to a multimeter to the connectivity tester, which is just, if these two things are completing a circuit, you will hear a beep. And this slow, methodical process of, once we figured out which one ground was, take every other pin, connect them, flip the switch, figure out over time, what does each one of these pins do? Slow, methodical work. Um, the back was more of the same. Um, I will point out what is super cool. You see those big uh, red and white things. Um, those aren't the cables. Those are the individual lead weights that were on each cable so that when you drop it in place, it immediately falls back exactly where it should go. Super satisfying. Um, but again, we look at these, like, these ports on the front. They look like they should just be like audio jacks like we're used to. But there is this incredibly intimidating but amazing cable management. Um, I've, I've heard, I have not validated this, but I've been told that like, we don't know how to do this style of cable management anymore. It's just something we've forgotten how to do. Um, there's these beautiful like, pieces of string tying these rows in place, and it's all meticulously oiled wire. Um, awesome stuff, but also these cables, they look, like, they look like quarter inch audio jacks. They're actually called Bantam, which just it's slightly differently physically shaped. Um, you can see three contacts on that, on that cable, uh, like two data pins and a ground and yet there are five pins coming out of the ports. Um, and each of those, again, has a whole bunch of cables coming out of them, and some of them are connecting to these pin blocks on the side that were wired up in ways that were really unintuitive. So it was a lot of manual trial and error of figuring out how is this actually wired up. Um, given that I did really value, I wanted to use the original cabling where possible. I wanted to not destroy as much as possible, sort of more out of sentimentality than any practical reason. Um, but it was great, meaning that here we could wire stuff up to these pin blocks and actually have it work. Uh, you can also see some of the other places where we are splicing into original wiring with our own wire. Um, the other coolest part of this hardware, one last neat thing to touch on, um, so all of those lights on the front, those were tiny little incandescent bulbs that just happened to be the shape of LEDs. Um, and they were attached via these hand-carved wooden sockets. Um, to be clear, this photo, this is with a modern LED. This isn't one of the original incandescent bulbs. But what? <laughs> um, and like this, this led to some really frustrating times. Uh, 
because how can we not use these, but it meant that getting the LEDs wired up was actually a pain. So besides like, major props to my colleague Miguel, who was gracious enough to spend a couple hours individually desoldering each of those bulbs and replacing them with a modern LED, um, which like, it would have been a major pain to get power to all the light bulbs at, like, the way it needed to run. If one of them burnt out, we probably would have needed to replace all of them. This was just easier. Um, but it led to these other problems where like, if you've done if you've done any sort of modern hardware work with LEDs, like often you'll use these things called NeoPixels or other similar daisy chainable LEDs. So an old fashioned cheap LED has two pins coming out of it. If you have power going in the right way and going out the other way, it'll light up. Hopefully you have a resistor in there too. Um, the problem with that is when you have a lot of them, like say a switchboard with 50 lights on top and 20 on the bottom, that means you need 70 IO pins, which is a lot of IO pins. Um, these days you can buy these beautiful daisy chainable LEDs that are multicolor and you can do whatever you want with them and you can connect basically an arbitrary amount uh, with a fixed number of data pins that is far smaller than 70. Um, but they require three pins instead of two. And we have these beautiful hand carved wooden sockets that have two contacts in them. Um, and even if you are willing to say like, all right, it's fine, we don't have to use the stupid beautiful hand carved wooden sockets. Well, that's how the LEDs get attached to the switchboard. Now we'd have to design our whole other mechanism for locking these LEDs into place and getting them wired up, which meant we really just wanted to use the actual sockets, which meant we had to deal with that many I opens, um, which was part of a larger systemic problem. That again, for anyone who has done electronics work, you're probably used to the idea that if you buy an Arduino off the shelf, it's got like 14 I opens. Um, and maybe I think five analog ones that you can maybe use as general purpose IO, I don't know. A Raspberry Pi has 20 something. Um, so we have potentially 70 LEDs. We have 50 ports on top, 20 cables, 20 of these switches that go two ways, so we need multiple pins for them. And then we also had a magnetic sensor so we could detect when you pick up or put down the phone and the rotary dial on the side. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> Like as someone who had done hobbyist scale electronics with an Arduino, I didn't know how to deal with, I now need hundreds of IO pins. Um, one of my colleagues at MIT gave me this like industrial grade prototyping board that I found a Windows machine, I installed the proprietary IDE and the hello world example didn't compile. Um, so my next step was looking at, all right, can I fabricate my own chips? Like at, at the Media Lab, the fabrication shop has a lot of stuff. I'd done a bunch of that before. Um, we had an Atmel chip that had like 54 IO pins, um, but everything in our fabrication shop was you are designing a circuit board yourself, you are milling it downstairs, you are uh, soldering the surface mount component yourself. These are very, very small. It takes a lot of practice to even deal with the most basic surface mount components. Um, and this specific chip had pads that were small enough that it was very clearly not meant for a human to solder by hand, and I'd never used a reflow station before. Um, so we then found sometimes the lazy solution is the best solution. Uh, I went down to Micro Center, which is like the, the local electronics store, and an Arduino Mega, um, which is like the Arduino board that uses that exact same Atmel chip. Knockoffs were 10 bucks each. Um, so we bought four of those, and that gave us like 200 I opens, which was enough. Um, and I designed and fabricated these little like Arduino shields for them that, that wired up to all the I opens we needed with quick cable disconnects. So it was super easy to swap them out if one broke, that sort of thing. Um, and it was all connected to a Mac Mini we had lying around driving it. Um, the last sort of electronics bit of trivia um, was figuring out how to actually figure out what cable was plugged into which port was a real problem. Um, sort of the solution I ended up on turns out to be something you might be familiar with if you've built your own mechanical keyboard and built out a key matrix. Um, so we had all of the all of the ports were configured as inputs where every, say everything was always high. Um, then you go through one, one, one by one and for each cable, say make it an output that's sending a low value, you can then read through every input. If any of them are low, that means you know that they're connected to each other. And so you can scan through your update loop and you know, all right, we know exactly which cables are plugged into which ports. Um, that was really easy in like a dozen lines of Arduino C in the first version of this when we only had the top two rows connected to each other. Um, which meant that we only had 20 plus 20 is 40, which meant we had enough pins that we could fit it on a single Arduino board. As opposed to the full 70 meant we now had to span it across two different Arduino boards. Um, and everything was connected to a computer, but going through serial over USB and then talking to a node process wasn't fast enough to really do the like 
timing synchronization in a way that would have worked, so we had to directly connect the two Arduinos to each other, which, again, if you are someone who actually does this sort of thing for a living, this is still relatively trivially easy. Um, but for me, it was sort of a slow process of figuring out, like, oh, this is all we have to do. Um, and so you'll notice everything I've talked about is very specifically just talking about hardware. I have not said anything about building software other than some Arduino C or actually designing a fun game, um, which was very intentional. Sort of my goal was looking at how can I tackle this hardware as its own problem so we could let the design space be its own problem. Um, which partly that's how I like to work. I've done this on a bunch of projects, but we also had a very concrete problem here, um, which this is, a, this is a story of poor project management that I don't recommend. Um, but so this game started out as custom hardware. Um, I built this for a fabrication class. So this is like custom water jet steel that was sandblasted and spray painted and some CNC and stained wood. Um, and then we submitted it to Alt Control GDC, which is the Game Developers Conference, big selection of games with weird physical controls. Um, and once it was accepted, we knew we wanted to go out and buy this hardware and do it right. Um, so when it was accepted to GDC was about a three month period. Uh, from when the switchboard showed up until we had to mail it out was about three weeks. And then from there, I had about two more weeks I could work on it, except I didn't have access to the switchboard. So all of that hardware stuff I just described was about three weeks of work. Um, I do not recommend that. I do not want to glorify crunch. Like, there are questions about whether I should have gotten into that situation at all. Um, but that meant that it was super important that I needed to be able to make a fun game without touching the hardware, because for most of the development cycle, I hadn't even seen the hardware yet. Um, so to me, what is beautiful about software compared to making with almost anything else is you have this instantaneous feedback cycle. Like me fabricating a new board for the Arduino Shield would be a couple hours. If I was mailing them out, it would take weeks. Um, I used to unit tests completing in anywhere between seconds to milliseconds, depending on what sort of stack it is. Um, so to me, thinking about this design process was a process of, for everything that I'm doing, what is the absolute tightest feedback loop I can get? And then how do I design sort of my concentric circles of feedback loops so that I can do everything I need to as quickly as possible for that thing? Um, so at the most basic level, there's this question of, I've written some code, does it do what I expected it to? Um, this often means tests. Uh, games are often pretty hard to test. Uh, I think a lot of reasons for that are cultural, but also a lot of it is, just the problem of testing content, and this is a giant, like, gnarly, stateful state machine that poking at it manually is gonna be easier than anything else. Um, so it was important to me to both be able to write unit tests, but also very quickly get to, like, a command line and have this sort of parser interactive fiction style interface where I could play the game without context shifting. Um, you can't really write a test to say, is this game fun yet? Um, you need manual playtesting. Um, the hard part about playtesting isn't the actual playtesting, it's getting playtesters um, and saying, hey, you need to come to my research lab, I can't come to you, also it needs to be in this three week period, that's a problem. Um, so I knew early on I wanted a version of the game that could run on an iPad, that seemed like the perfect compromise of people can understand a drag and drop touchscreen controls, uh, I can fit it in my bag and take it to playtest events I was already going to in Cambridge and San Francisco. Um, like that seemed like the right balance. I don't have a good screenshot of it because it no longer compiles because it's an old version of Swift. But you can sort of see it on top of the switchboard there. Um, and then finally, like you can test, is this game fun on an iPad? You can, you can build a fun time management game. Um, but a lot of stuff is harder to test, like the onboarding experience. Um, it's very easy to hand an iPad to someone and say, this gray rectangle represents a cable, you can drag it around. When people sit down at this actual Swiss board, it is incredibly intimidating. And it takes them a while to learn, I can do things that are incorrect and this scary game isn't going to punish me. Um, I, can, I can use this, I can use this, like plug in the cables with force and this 100 year old hardware is going to outlive me, I'm not gonna destroy it. Um, and those sorts of things can't really be tested without the actual hardware, um, which also meant that given that the hardware was in my physical hands for such a short period of time and I didn't know when I could get people there, at any given time I needed to be able to deploy the current build of the game onto the hardware without much fussing. Like a big heavy deploy process would have been a non-starter. Um, so I think most of the people in this room are software engineers. You can start to see many shapes to the answer of this problem depending on what flavor of software you do. Um, like in broad strokes, this is a problem where we wanna separate like this business logic engine of a game from like how it is actually literally playing. So we have this little JavaScript game that manages the state machine and all that. Um, that just, when you instantiate it, I pass in an object 
that the game has this API contract where it knows it can, it can turn on Mabel's LED and it doesn't care if turning on Mabel's LED means a physical LED is turned on or a UI view is changing colors or we're console logging something out. Um, it just knows that that's going to work, which is great because it means we can make the game run anywhere. We can throw in that fake adapter for tests or CLI or one that's uh, running in JavaScript core on an iPad with some bindings out to native Swift code that's creating a view layer or talking to the actual four Arduinos and we can separate engine development from hardware development in the way we want to. Um, which again, this probably sounds straightforward to a lot of you. Um, depending on where you're coming from, you talk about MVC or MVVM or solid object-oriented design principles or like React style view as a pure function of state and unidirectional data flow. Um, but that's not really how games or hardware work. Like these are both sort of fields of engineering that are coming out of spaces of much more constrained resources, whether that is like literally a microcontroller that has very limited space for writing your program or a game engine where you're running on limited hardware and need to have a 3D engine and physics and all these complex things. Um, which means like if you're writing microcontroller code, you're probably writing in the Arduino IDE and you have a single function that runs on start and then you have an update loop. Um, if you're writing code in Unity, you are operating inside Unity's monolithic framework of this is how your game is structured. Um, and so with these, it's very difficult to say, I want to optimize for what is gonna make me most productive. Um, whereas conversely, it's 2018, computers are really cheap. Um, I was able to solve my microcontroller problem with a bunch of $10 Arduino knockoffs um, and a Mac mini that we had lying around, but they cost 500 bucks, an Intel NUC is a couple hundred, a Raspberry Pi is 40 or a Pi Zero is five. Um, we honestly could have run this game on a Pi Zero, but we didn't need to because we had the Mac mini. Like, I think a lot of it comes down to like if, if you're a developer, like a web developer working at a startup, you're used to the idea that our servers aren't scaling. Um, at some point we need to bring someone in to rewrite this code so it can actually scale, but for now we can throw more money at Heroku or EC2 or whoever. And right now, because we're constrained on developer time, like in the long run that won't work, but it'll work for now. The sort of same thing happened here. Like I could have gotten Hello Operator running on the Arduinos and done some clever synchronization to actually have the game logic execute on the microcontroller, but why would I do that when I can run it on this Mac Mini? Um, and it lets me focus on writing software that's optimized for ease of debugging and playtesting rather than anything else. Like it let me spend time wearing my artist hat and my designer hat rather than like an electrical engineering hat or an embedded systems hat, um, which are great hats to wear. Apparently I have a giant hat collection. Um, <laughs> but being able to work in this ecosystem that I knew helped as well, which is also where like everything I talked about was JavaScript, uh, specifically TypeScript, because I thought for me at the rate I was moving, like that type system was the right balance of this is gonna help me catch stupid errors when writing tests doesn't make sense. Um, but really anything that is cross-platform is good enough, like JavaScript, C, C Sharp, Java, anything that you're comfortable with, um, especially the sort of really worked Given that I'm not making these traditional games, these are experiences where I don't need a physics engine, I don't need a 3D renderer, everything I am doing is, is my, of my own design more or less. Um, which also ties into, like for me personally, JavaScript worked well, but again, any cross-platform language worked, because uh, once you're working in the same tooling across multiple projects, you can start to have cross-pollination. Um, so all of this was my side project while I was at MIT. Um, my main project was working on location-based storytelling and looking at how can we use fiction to connect people to real-world spaces. And so I had these essentially interactive radio plays where you'd go to a physical space, download an app on your phone, and as you would walk around, we'd sort of change the story based on where you're walking. Like, do you take the left path or the right path? But also, is it raining? Are you there in the winter versus the summer? What are the things we can do with the bundle of sensors in your pocket? Um, so I built this sort of interactive fiction narrative engine and custom scripting language um, all in JavaScript that was designed around. So you have this sort of linear or multi-linear narrative structure or dialogue tree. How can you modify that based off of arbitrary data sensors instead of like clicking on hyperlinks or making menu like dialogue choices like a traditional interactive fiction engine might. Um, so then I had this problem the first time I showed the switchboard. Uh, I had to explain how to play the game to everyone who walked by and wanted to play it, which if you have ever shown any sort of installation like this in a festival setting, you know the absolute most important thing is to make sure that it runs itself. Um, so the next time I showed it, I know I needed an interactive tutorial um, and it needed to be at the level of like, we're gonna tell you what to do and here's sort of the, the didactic steps to play this game, but anytime you do something wrong, we need to be dynamic enough to tell you exactly what you did wrong so you understand why, 
um, which if only I'd already written a dialogue engine designed to handle exactly that. Um, and since all this was written in the same sort of ecosystem of tooling, it was trivially easy to wire up this existing engine into the switchboard game. And so now this is powering the switchboard's tutorial. Uh, as an aside, if any of you are interactive fiction people, you should check out my tool, it's great. Um, the slides will be available later. Um, another example, uh, so the first time I showed it, I had this problem where often the, like this old crusty hardware having been shipped across the country, um, things were going wrong, I didn't know why, I couldn't tell is the hardware malfunctioning? Why, like, why does the internal state of the game not match the state of the physical hardware? Um, but I already had this concept of, so this engine has like an, an output object that's essentially treating as an event emitter, that it's emitting these events of like, you should turn on this LED. Um, I also already have this iPad build of the game that works. What if I could just broadcast to multiple outputs, and what if one of those was actually some JavaScript blue code that connected via WebSocket to the iPad app, and all of a sudden I had an iPad app that I could hold and see in real time what the game thought its internal state was and I could fix things as need be. Um, and because everything was in place, this was maybe half an hour of work um, for something like architecturing this differently wouldn't have, wouldn't have meant, oh, this is going to take longer for me to do. Like categorically, this wouldn't have been a solution I would have considered, um, which is fantastic. But so I think everything I'm talking about, like this is, this is about weird, Games that use non-traditional interfaces, that doesn't mean that they have to be things that use embedded electronics. I think sort of anything that is a game that operates outside of this world of, like here is a game engine and you have characters moving around. Um, like I've done stuff like this for like web games and party games. Um, I also worked on this game called When in Rome. This is a tabletop game that you buy on Amazon, like a box of cardboard components, uh, nothing electronic in there, but you also need a smart speaker, like an Alexa device. Um, and so Alexa acts as sort of the game master for this trivia game, and as you fly around the world, you hear uh, interview like questions asked to you by locals in the city as you're traveling in the game. Um, and so this is all, like for those of you who haven't done any sort of smart speaker app or skill development, um, this is all web tech. There's sort of a model where when you speak to your Alexa, uh, that gets turned into an intent, which is sort of a, a data object representing here is what the user wants to do. Um, that's sent to your web server as an HTTP request. You get to do whatever you want with it and then send back a response that has some XML that gets translated into text being spoken or audio playing or whatever. Um, if you're doing the sort of development, what can be a little frustrating is a lot of the official tools for Amazon or other platforms like that is the only model that exists. There is no good way to test your app other than deploying it or finding a way to like get your local dev machine on the open internet so you can actually talk to your Alexa device and run through Amazon servers. There's no good way to test it locally or type on the command line instead of having to physically talk, which is a real problem when say you're doing this in an office of a tech incubator where every single company is building Alexa skills. <laughs> um, so the result was something very similar. Like we. Conceptually, like the entire game is a state machine and all of the intents that you're getting in are edges to make state machine transitions, which means that like our actual game's API, as it were, is a single function where you pass in the intent you were given, you pass in some state that represents like what is this current user session with the game, and then an output object, which again, here is a nice little interface that knows how to do like mutatable things to the outside world. Um, and then eventually it returns a new, a new state for the next the next run through, the next time that user does something. Um, and so for the production build of the game, this is just wired up inside a tiny little node app that takes the request from Amazon, runs it through this, and then that output object spits out XML back to Amazon. But we can also have, like in theory, here is a, it's easy to integrate this with any other voice UI platform that we'd want to ship the game on. Or more practically, here is the command line version of the game to let me test without going to Amazon's website. Um, but so we've gotten pretty deep into this of like, all right, we're, we're writing all of this code to get this hardware working. Why does this actually matter? Um, again, if my goal was to make a time management game where you're a switchboard operator, I could have shipped the iPad version. I could have just written it in whatever I wanted and orders of magnitude more people would have played it than have even heard of this thing. Um, it really matters though. Like to me, what's the magic of Hello Operator is when I show it at events, um, and someone will come up and like maybe there's someone who plays games, maybe they're not. It is clear they're probably not someone who would ever like take their free time and go to a telecommunications museum. Um, but they see this thing and they immediately go, oh, that, I've always wondered how that works. Like how does that work? 
Um, and then they will sit down and in this noisy, hectic, loud show floor, spend like half an hour in a deep state of flow learning how to do someone's day job from 90 years ago. Um, <laughs> and that's super cool. Like it's, it's gamification, but the good kind of gamification. Um, like if it was a little more didactic, it wouldn't work, but it works because you're learning, you're learning a real world skill, which I love designing games based on real world skills because you already have this really nice skill curve. Like, Things that people actually do in the real world are often already designed as good games to some extent. Um, but also you know it's an obsolete and useless skill. Like it feels like play in a way that it wouldn't otherwise even though we are secretly teaching you something. Um, which is awesome. And even if you don't care about that, like one layer of abstraction up, like this is kind of obvious, but the way you physically interact with something shapes your experience of it. Like even purely in software, using a piece of software that you use every day on your tablet or on your phone, that feels tangibly different from using the same thing on your computer. Even within that, using like a shiny new MacBook's butterfly keyboard feels different than using a nice mechanical keyboard with nice cherry switches. Um, and like as an artist making weird experiences, having that as a dynamic range to play with is really interesting. Um, but even given all that, like maybe, maybe you're here at Strange Loop because you're, you're you're a programmer, you're here to program. I think a lot of the strange loop audience is not that. Um, but even that, like if you don't care about artistic expression as its own ideal, um, doing something with physical hardware is super interesting and useful and teaches you a lot about what you do, even if you're just plugging some LEDs into an Arduino. Um, like what you learn about the way other forms of engineering work is going to inform your day-to-day -day work. Like if you're having to do a literal smoke test where you turn the hardware on and make sure it doesn't light up in flames because you soldered something wrong, like that might impact how you think about software testing. Um, having to deal with spending three hours fabricating a PCB and then having it not work, like that'll give you a little more appreciation for feedback cycles in web dev and maybe give you a little more discipline when trying to get things to work the first time. Um, but also, above all, I'm really just being selfish. Um, like I want more th weird things like this to exist in the world. Like this is, this has been a talk with a bunch of technical stuff, but it is not a like deep down technical dive. I, I just wanna show off cool things that I've made so that you can go be inspired and make cool things yourself and using, using this idea of you don't have to go and learn game development or all these other forms of engineering. You can use a lot of the tools you already use in your day to day life as a programmer and apply those to making something weird and cool and exciting. And that's all I've got. Thanks.